am. And so now I'm going to go ahead and introduce our speakers, Jennifer and Mark. Jennifer Larson is a teaching associate professor and director of undergraduate studies in the UNC English department. Her teaching and research interests include African American literature and African American drama, film studies, especially race and contemporary cinema, American literature and composition, especially writing in and about the law. Her most recent book entitled Understanding Walter Mosley offers a critical review of Mosley's work across genres. She received her PhD in English from UNC Chapel Hill, and she is the recipient of multiple teaching awards at UNC, including the Joseph M. Flora Award in 2012 and 2017. We are also joined by Mark McNeely, who teaches in the areas of marketing and organizational behavior in both the full-time MBA and online MBA at UNC programs. My guess is, Mark, you're going to be doing more online teaching going forward. Um, he serves as faculty advisor for the STAR program and executive coach in the leadership program. He has served as a global marketing executive and has several years of experience at both Lenovo and IBM. His business background includes branding, strategy, marketing, market intelligence, management, manufacturing, and personnel. He is the author of a popular strategy book based on Sun Tzu's Art of War entitled Sun Tzu in the Art of Business, Six strategy, Strategic Principles for Managers, as well as George Washington in the Art of Business, Leadership Principles of America's First Commander-in-Chief. Thank you both to Mark and Jennifer for presenting your research today. And with that, I will hand it over to you all to, to start your presentation. Thank you so much. Um, thank you all for being here. Um, I'm excited to be a guinea pig. <laughs> this is fun. Um, and I'm excited that we could, could still have this event and um, you know, through, the, through the glorious world of technology. So I'm going to kick off the presentation with the, with the first half and um, then Mark is going to take over and uh, wrap things up and uh, lead us into the Q&A. So in general, um, I'm going to talk a little bit about why we did this research, uh, the approach that we took in um, reaching folks. And uh, I'm going to start talking about the findings. And then Mark is going to, um, to go through the findings. And uh, it, the latter part of the findings, we've sort of grouped them into main points or you know, kind of umbrella uh, points for the findings. And then Mark's also going to talk about some recommendations. Uh, some preliminary recommendations that we have coming out of those findings. So uh, again, first thing, talking about why we even did this. Um, so, you know, clearly this maybe has been overshadowed by some recent things, but there's still, there, even even in, amongst the, the, the pandemic and um, uh, other issues, uh, and, and certainly with the, the rise of the uh, Black Lives Matter movement, again, there's ongoing discussion of, uh, in, you know, at the state level, the national level, and certainly the campus level about free expression and civil discourse. But what we found is that, you know, it was all very, uh, you know, very hot, but there wasn't really a lot of uh, you know, really specific evidence coming out of that. So we, you know, first and foremost, wanted to understand what was happening specifically at UNC. It's its, its own place. Um, then we also, uh, we were thinking, though, that understanding what happened at UNC would help us understand what's happening nationally. So even though it's its own specific place, it can still be pretty microcosmic. Um, and again, we noticed that the analysis that we saw in the current discussions and the discussions that were out there were typically, especially as they applied to college campuses, were typically not evidence-based, right? They were anecdotal or, um, again, weren't trying to offer a fulsome picture or kind of talk, told from one side or the other. Uh, and also, as we found each other in this, uh, you know, as this kind of came up in various campus discussions and, you know, I connected with Mark and, Mark connected with Tim, and then we all connected together. We realized that um, you know our our disciplinary backgrounds, our um, sort of ideological backgrounds, made us a really interesting team, and uh, one that offered a lot of different uh, perspectives on this issue, and that we could really increase the credibility of what we were doing. So this is us. This is my old hair. 
<laughs> and my old glasses. <laughs> but uh, and Tim unfortunately couldn't be here today. Um, but I'll, I'll nod a lot to him. He's uh, really the, the survey and data guru. So I'll be giving a lot of shout outs to him as well. So I'll talk a little bit about the approach. And this is like the tangible approach to what we did. So most of the information, the data that you'll see uh, came from our survey. And so we released the survey in two waves. So the first wave was a, a random sample, but it was a stat, stat, wow, stratified. That's, that doesn't come out right <laughs> easily, does it? Stratified uh, sample. And we worked with um, so, some social scientists. I mean, not only Tim, who this is his expert area of expertise, but we consulted with uh, you know, the former vice provost for research on the best ways to do this, as well as the Office of Institutional Research an assessment at UNC to making sure that we were stratifying correctly to get a, a full sample because we didn't want to just send this thing out because what happens is then you just get like the people who are really angry or the people who are really happy. Um, and so you're, you're not going to get that that fulsome picture. It's, you know, it's kind of like Yelp reviews <laughs> um, or something like that. So we did the, the first way we did, it was incentivized. We did this very specifically stratus I'm not even going to try <laughs> um, stratified uh, model. And then, so we got about, we got about 500 ish responses, which was a really good completion rate of 26% on that. Um, and then we sent it out to everyone else um, with uh, no incentive. And we did again, get a, another 500 plus responses, 3% completion rate. So that gave us a total of about a thousand responses. Um, and you know, th that may, I know, seem on, on, on face to be not very many, but response rate wise, that's actually pretty good um, in the social science world. So, um, and we actually pooled them together in what you're going to see going forward, because um, when we looked at, you know, how the, the data shook out, um, there weren't really that many differences between the stratified, stratified and the, uh, um, the, the, the remainder of students sample. We also did some focus groups and um, you'll hear Mark especially refer to some comments from those focus groups. We reached out to eight sort of politically minded um, or oriented groups on the campus, but uh, we, we only got about three uh, groups that were ultimately willing to participate. So we have three interviews there um, that you'll see some comments reflected from that. Uh, so I'm going to talk a little bit about the findings. And before I jump into this, uh, I do uh, want to say that there were some really unique things that we did in terms of the methodology of how we asked the questions. So um, you'll, in the next couple of slides, you'll hear me talk about, um, and, and then Mark going forward, you'll hear us talk about um, a random class that was selected or the class that they're talking about. So what some surveys in higher education had done going forward, and they would just say like across your experience in all of your classes or in a class that you took recently, did you have such and such a such experience? But what we did in our instrument was um, we asked the students to actually input their schedule from the previous semester. Um, and they could call the classes whatever they wanted. They could call it English 105 or they could call it ENGL 105. It didn't matter. They put in their schedule. And then uh, the instrument would, would select a random course to ask them questions about. So it wasn't, they weren't trying to think into some nebulous place, but they were given a very specific class. So in some of the questions, they might say that something didn't apply because it didn't apply to that class. Either political things didn't come up or, um, or something like that, um, or it may have been not applicable for other reasons. Um, and then we did give them a chance to add, to choose a class of their that, you know, another class that they picked from that schedule to reflect on. Um, so that's a little bit what you'll see here. Um, we also did some really interesting things in terms of, um, you know, how people identified uh, things they didn't agree with. And Mark's going to talk about that going forward, a least liked theory model. Um, so, um, you know, we, we asked the students, you know, did, did politics come up in the class? And for the classes that did, uh, we saw some, some kind of, you know, promising results so that the, the, when politics came up in classes that a majority of the professors did try to discuss um, both sides of political issues and encourage opinions from across the political 
um, spectrum. So, you know, for example, 53.8% of respondents agreed that this happened. Um, and then we had some neutrals or that it was irrelevant. But what's I think most important here is the, the disagreement, right? It's a very small level of disagreement that this was not, that this was happening. Um, and then even amongst um, students who identify as conservative, the disagreement rate was pretty low. So they were also seeing professors trying to encourage, you know, they agreed that that was happening, that that encouraging was happening. Um, and then again, there's a pretty small disagreement rate that uh, the course instructor was interested in learning from people with opinions that were different from theirs. So even just beyond encouraging that participation, they also thought um, that you know, there was a pretty high percentage that you know, was in some level of agreement that, that the professors were also interested in these ideas and um, bringing them into the class. Uh, however, we did see some data that were less um, optimist <laughs> and that might suggest that there that this was not consistent right that there there were some instances in which free expression and constructive dialogue were not necessarily promoted consistently or across the board so again going back to that randomly selected class that they talked about uh, at the beginning so that, that the students had put in and the instrument chose for them um, if they suggested on their responses that politics came up in that randomly selected class, um, so that was about 60% of the classes we were looking at, um, they, there were some concerns. So nearly a quarter of the students said that they were worried about the professor having a lower of opinion of them. Um, a little lower, we're seeing 15% um, concerned about a grade. And again, this we weren't asking them if these things actually happened, but what they were concerned about, mm -hmm. right? Um, but then we see a big jump right in there are with, they were concerned that their peers would have a lower opinion of them uh, around 40%. And then some pretty big concern, you know, getting into the 20s about whether peers would post about them on social media. And then another number that really stood out to us is that we saw about 36.2% of um, the respondents in, in this grouping saying that um, they had engaged in self-censorship, right? So they'd held back a sincerely held political belief for some reason, um, at least once. And then you got about a quarter saying that they did so multiple times throughout the course of the semester in that class. And then um, again, coming back to this consistency issue, um, they, we did, also ask him like, what were, um, you know, how would you describe folks in what we call the out group? So the other side of things, right? So how would the students who identified as liberal um, describe the students who identified conservative and vice versa? And we saw that we, some hesitation in applying the positive attributes. So we had a list of positive things and a list of negative things, um, but, so like one of them, for example, was open minded. Um, so 27.7 of the, excuse me, 27.7 percent of the folks who were responding to the survey and said they were conservative thought that liberal students were also conservative, also open minded. Um, but on the flip side, 8 percent of the students who identified as liberal said that conservatives were open minded. So we're seeing a major discrepancy there in how views um, students group, view each other. Um, and then we, you know, people were certainly, we're seeing big numbers when it comes to the negative attributes. So one of the, you know, the big attributes we talked about are racist and sexist. Um, racist being a particularly applicable one right now. And then, so 65% of the students who identified as liberal and took the survey said that they thought conservative students were racist or sexist. Um, similarly, 75% of students who identified as conservative said that their liberal peers were condescending. So we're seeing those negative attributes applied there. And, um, but we did see again, some, some oops, I'll get to it <laughs> there. Um, Mark got the hard part of controlling the PowerPoint. Uh, that said, there were, there were some, again, some glimmers of good things. Um, 
So many students in each group did see the other group as an important part of the campus community, but we did see some social engagement discrepancies. So, you know, so between, depending on the ideology, uh, we saw 15 to 35% of students saying that they were unwilling to engage socially with the other group. Um, so, and that they did not even enjoy taking classes with them. Um, and then 20% of the respondents who identified as liberal and uh, a little over 14% of the respondents who identified as conservative said that UNC would actually be better off without the other group. Um, so again, some, some concerning and some interesting numbers there. Mark? Yeah, so I'll take over from here. Thanks, Jennifer. Um, so the third theme that we ran across was that all those students from across the political spectrum uh, face challenges related to free expression. The challenges seem to be more acute for students who identified as conservative. So if you, if you look at the, the table below there, um, the anxieties about expressing political views and self-censorship tend to be stronger about uh, by those that identify as conservative. So here, if you look at the table, liberals versus conservatives, and again, this is, as Jennifer mentioned, a randomly chosen class. Concerns that they would get a lower grade, 6% versus about 38%. Instructor would have a lower opinion, 12% versus almost 50%. Students would have a lower opinion, it's about three times higher for conservatives. And then that self-censorship piece where uh, respondents would self-censor, it's about 24% for liberals and 68% for conservatives. So this is where we started to see a little bit of the split. Again, I think there's kind of two important points here. Um, one is that, that both liberals and conservatives face this issue. Um, and then but the point here is that conservatives tend to face it more acutely uh, in, in, in this area. So following this theme, another thing that we looked at uh, was how often students heard disrespectful, inappropriate, or offensive comments about 12 different groups that we asked about. So we asked about um, how often you heard, you know, disrespectful, et cetera, comments about women, men, whites, African-Americans, Hispanics, Latinos, Asian students born outside the US, Christians, Muslims, LGBT individuals, political liberals, and political conservatives. And then we broke that out by <clears throat> the responses of how many liberals heard, for example, um, those negative comments about women, moderates heard them, conservatives heard them. And a couple things I think that are of interest here. One is that political conservatives uh, were pretty much far and away the ones that not just conservatives heard the worst about, um, or these heard these uh, disrespectful, inappropriate, or offensive comments about the most, um, but liberals as well, right? So that's the highest number for liberals there on the, across all these different groups. <clears throat> so that's, so this is kind of another big takeaway. It wasn't just conservatives who felt they were hearing these negative things. Liberals heard, were hearing about conservatives as well. I think the other interesting takeaway from this slide, though, is groups that liberals prefer to, I would say, and this is maybe a little strong, liberals, groups that liberals tend to um, care about more perhaps than, and then and versus groups that conservatives care about more, you'll see that they, there's a tendency to always hear more disrespectful, inappropriate or offensive groups, comments about the groups you care about. So if you look at, you know, women, for example, which is a group, you know, oftentimes um, liberals care a, a lot about, um, you got 32% versus 10% for conservative, um, but the, it just flips totally around on men, right? And it's, if you go down consistently down this thing, you know, if you look at um, conservatives, um, or even political liberals, right? Political liberals, um, liberals feel they hear more offensive comments about them than conservatives feel that they hear about liberals. So it's just kind of interesting is you just, it's consistent across all these different groups. If you care more about a group, you tend to hear more negative comments about them, which, I, which is interesting. I don't know if it's that they actually hear more comments or that they're more sensitive to comments about them, or they interpret things that maybe are, are or are not you know, negative or disrespectful uh, as negative and disrespectful. But the big takeaway here, at least from the, the acuteness standpoint, is that conservatives are significantly more, tend to significantly um, have more disrespectful, inappropriate, or offensive comments made about them pretty much across the board. So this was another interesting thing we did. Um, how willing are liberal and conservative students willing to engage? Um, and so, how this has been done in the past, you might say, hey, if you heard an offensive comment, what would you do? Would you write an opinion uh, letter letter to the editor? Would you block a speaker, et cetera? <clears throat> and 
and we thought that's kind of a fuzzy way to do that. It's sort of sort of a hypothetical. And so what we wanted to do is give them specific political views that they would, might object to, either liberals or conservatives, that were present at UNC. And then given that view, what would steps would they take with respect to that view? So these were some of the views. So these are positions liberal students might hold and positions conservative students might hold. And I just happened to <clears throat> put a couple on here with um, relative to immigration, right? So position liberal students might hold is most undocumented slash illegal immigrants should be granted amnesty and equal, eventually equal rights as US citizens versus a conservative student might hold the view that the United States should build a wall on the Southern border to decrease undocumented slash illegal, <coughs> illegal immigration. So again, they were just given a, a number of positions that they might object to. And then I asked, well, so how would you, how would you deal with that? And so we gave them actually a, a number of things they could do anything from, um, Again, writing a letter to the editor. Um, maybe I can just give, actually give you give you that list here. <clears throat> so they might do things like writing an opinion piece, asking a challenging question, writing graffiti um, on the dorm of a student, writing graffiti on the office uh, of a faculty member, yelling profanity, shoving someone. So those were kind of the comments. <clears throat> and kind of the, the big thing that stuck out here was that 19% of the respondents who identified as liberal. Um, for that, on, that on, on, the, on the spectrum, felt it was okay to create an obstruction to a speaker who held one of those objectionable, objectionable views. And around the same 19% um, who identified as liberal endorsed blocking other students from entering an event where a speaker might argue for that idea. Uh, and you would contrast that to about 3% of respondents who identify as conservative endorsing creating an obstruction uh, to a speaker who holds an objectionable view. <clears throat> So this we thought was kind of kind of an important point uh, because all public universities uh, must respect free speech, and so these are some things when you think talk about creating obstructions um, or blocking entrance. Um, that's that's where you start to kind of get into um, limiting the ability of others to to have an opportunity to hear hear other views. <clears throat> so that was kind of some of the bad news, and now we kind of get into um, some of the more, I guess we'd say, positive news. Um, students from across the political spectrum do want more opportunities to engage with those who think differently. So um, almost all uh, conservative respondents felt that UNC invited too few conservative speakers. But interestingly, most respondents who identify as liberal, about 37%, say that there are too few conservative speakers than liberals who are saying that there are too many conservative speakers, only about 15%. Similarly, more respondents who identify as liberals think that there are too few conservative speakers, again, that's the same 37%, than say there are too few liberal speakers. So again, even on the liberal side, there's this feeling that, yeah, we think we, think we need to hear more conservatives. And then another positive note, about 58% of respondents who identified as liberal, 62% who identified as moderate, and about 76% who identified as conservative <clears throat> felt the need for more constructive disagreement across the political spectrum. So, they were willing to listen to other people and disagree with them, but could disagree with them in a constructive manner. Okay, so let's, that takes us to our themes and recommendations. So the four themes you see over here, are the, the four big things that Jennifer and I talked about. So the first one again, students saying that when politics comes up, the majority of their professors do try to discuss both sides of the political issues and encourage opinions from across the spectrum, that's a positive. However, we see that the current campus Climate doesn't consistently promote free expression and constructive dialogue. Um, we also see that conservatives tend to face more acute challenges in this area. But then again, on a positive side, we see the students uh, are across the spectrum want more opportunities to engage with those who think differently. <clears throat> so out of this, we can develop some different recommendations. Um, these are the four. So and I'll, and I'll dive a little bit deeper in each of these four, but I'll just give them to you now. Um, remind students and faculty of the importance of free expression and give them training on how to do that. Support faculty by offering suggestions for and uh, suggestions for and training on how to foster a welcoming and inclusive environment in the classroom. Provide more opportunities to hear external speakers, <clears throat> providing evidence-based ideas from across the political, social, and cultural spectrum. <clears throat> and then this last one really falls back on Jennifer, Tim, and I to continue the, and expand the research we've been doing on free expression and constructive dialogue and track our progress. Okay, so we're going to go through the four recommendations. Um, so the first one, again, remind students and faculty of the importance of free expression and offer training uh, on how to, how to do that. Um, 
there's a, a, a few thoughts here, right? The first is that to ensure from the start students and it's understand the importance of free speech and are given the opportunities and tools to engage in constructive dialogue. And this can begin in orientation, but really needs to continue um, through their time at UNC. And it can be reinforced with regular communications, workshops, et cetera, that, that do that. <clears throat> um, and it, this is it's funny because we never did thought about the word social distance <laughs> in, this, in the COVID context when we wrote this. Little did we know how uh, those words would, what those words would mean, you know, six months from six months from when we wrote them. <clears throat> but events are reduced on social distance between politicals and, or conservatives and liberals. So the idea here being, hey, if, the, if we see each other as people first and not as labels of conservatives or liberals, we might be more willing to engage and be more understanding of each other. The second one is uh, offering suggestions and training and how to, uh, to faculty and how to welcome, provide a welcoming and inclusive environment. Um, so one of the big things we think that's important, and I do this in my class, is <laughs> notes in the syllabus, um, encouraging free expression and constructive dialogue. I talk about it in the first day of class, affirm that I am uh, great impartially. Um, and you'll see some names of organizations within campus. Um, so these are the ones that we would be reaching out to, to to make this work. And we were in the process of actually starting that whole thing when COVID hit. And so um, we had, I think the week that we all pretty much went to online, we were supposed to have these, start these meetings and we had to you know, push them back. So now we'll, we'll be re-engaging here as we get to returning to campus. <clears throat> and have some workshops on how to do that. Um, and also have an end of semester Q&A or student feedback on how well the professors that were able to um, provide that environment. Um, the third recommendation is really providing more opportunities to hear external speakers providing ideas and evidence-based ideas, and so not just any ideas, but we're a research university, so we expect to have research to, to back up the, the points that you're trying to make. Um, but again, again, get them from across the political, social, and cultural spectrum. And because UNC tends to be, as many universities are, right, more, more left-leaning, <clears throat> and so you, there's a tendency to bring in um, more people that might align to your views, we would say we might want to rely a little bit less exclusively on individuals, programs, and students to bring in speakers, but instead leverage campus organizations that invite speakers to, be, to debate ideas from across the, the, the political, cultural, and social spectrum. And then the last point, and again, this falls on Jennifer, Tim, and I, and whoever else might want to join our merry band, but expand our research on free expression and constructive dialogue uh, beyond students to include faculty, staff, administration, and then see how we're doing um, in regular interviews, maybe every year, every couple of years, um, to track our progress and identify emerging issues. Um, so again, expand the research we've done from undergrads to faculty, administration, grad students, uh, maybe run some more focus groups, um, start doing this, uh, this measurement um, and biannually, uh, and then something that we, we can't do, but we would suggest that the system would do, would expand this type of research to the entire UNC system. So, you know, um, App State should be doing it, NC State should be doing it, um, you know, every Wilmington should be doing it, every, every uh, institution in the system um, should be provide, doing this kind of research. So those are the, that's kind of the findings and the re recommendations. And with that, I think um, we'll just open it up for questions, I guess. Okay, excellent. Mark, if you could stop sharing your screen, then people will be able to see the person who's answering the questions. Thank you. So I'm gonna get them off of our, our Q&A box. Uh, the first question comes from Bill. He says, some Florida legislators have be been wanting to fund a study like yours in our state but faculty organizations have pushed back strongly. Do you have any suggestions for how to alleviate faculty concerns? Would you guys be open to replicating your study in Florida or to working with scholars in our state to do an objective study like this? I think the easy part would be, we would be happy to work with any scholars in Florida who wanted to do that. I think that's, I mean, the easiest part is to hand them the instrument and tell them what we've done. So I think that's an easy part. Um, I don't know about bandwidth to actually do the research. <laughs> We've got enough going on, but certainly we'd be yeah, willing yeah. to help. Um, we uh, we actually presented this research at the Foundation for Individual Rights. Sorry, in Foundation for Individual Rights in Education, the Fire Conference, and um, you know we did have there is some interest. There are some people doing things like this, and we talked about collaborating with different schools. 
Um, you know, and, and I think the key thing to reassuring faculty is to, um, you know, tell them or just really emphasize that this is not about being punitive. Um, it's not about singling somebody out as doing a good job or a bad job. It's just trying to get a sense of, of what's happening and what the students are seeing. Um, and so that you can, you can have an evidence-based approach to something. Because like we saw here, we have some things that were like, oh, wow, this pushes against this idea of like liberal indoctrination, right? That's really not happening here in the way that some people charge. But we do see some areas for improvement. And with this data, we can start thinking about what that would look like. Um, and I think also emphasizing to faculty that, um, you know, you're not trying to meddle in curriculum, uh, but again, you're just providing evidence that might shape this. And two, that there might be ways uh, to build on this to think about what faculty concerns are, right? Because certainly a lot of what students are saying, we hear from faculty too, especially faculty at who are on the fixed term, um, who are in other precarious positions, right? So setting up something like this and being invested in free expression and dialogue at the student level as a basis, then just creates a create space for us to start thinking about faculty and academic freedom in new ways as well. Yes, and I think that, so those are all good points. I, I think the one thing I might add too is like, I would, I would, if I were them, I would have form a group like ours where it's, not, you know, it's not a bunch of conservatives, or it's not a bunch of liberals that are doing the research, it's people from across the spectrum, from different disciplines who are doing it, right? And I think that might reassure the faculty that it's not, you know, it's not being done to make a specific point, but actually it's gonna be done in a proper way. And also perhaps share the, share the methodology with them so they're aware of how it's gonna work and then they feel comfortable with the methodology. And our, our work was very, faculty. you know, we're all faculty. Um, we started by taking this to faculty executive committee. This kind of came out of faculty executive committee at UNC, came out of some things that were happening at faculty council. So, um, you know, I, I think having every, everything be faculty driven from within and that it's about, you know, understanding the specifics of what's happening at an institution, not necessarily trying to make broad sweeping change because every place is different. Excellent, thank you. Uh, this next question comes from George Lanou. He says, what percentage of your surveyed students were moderates, not identified as either liberal or conservative? And what, in a lot of your slides, you focus just on, you know, the liberals and conservatives. He says, what were the opinions of the moderates? I think the opinions of the moderates tend to be like right between them, <laughs> as one might expect them to be right between the liberals and conservatives. And and that's probably the easiest. Um, yeah, so um, I just, I went and just double checked the, um, the data. Um, so if you look at overall, so seven of the different samples, 17% of the incentivized sample, 18.5% of the unincentivized sample. So for a pool of 17.7% of respondents were identified as moderate. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, you know, it may, like Mark, as we expected, they, they kind of were in the middle. Um, but you know there were certain metrics where they weren't uh, in the middle, and they, they sort of jumped out. But uh, so, for example, I, I think the one that I kept when we would do you know different lengths of participant of, of presentation on this, one of the things that I found interesting was the the one that we're calling the self censorship um, data, right? So you're still seeing almost half um, of of the moderate students saying that they are self-censoring at some point. And their number is actually really high in the once category. So if we said the one time, they were at 20%. So the other two groups were at like near 10 and they were like 20% was one. Um, and then 18% two to five times. Um, so you, you know, then their numbers got low, but you know, they were, they were doing this too. So it wasn't like I'm, too liberal or I'm too conservative and I can't talk. The, sort of, the folks in the middle were sort of feeling a little wiggly too. And, you know, we don't know why. I mean, could it be like, I'm not liberal enough or um, I'm not sure maybe this is conserv too conservative to say or not conservative enough, depending on the situation. So it's hard to know why. And that's why we need more of the, the expanded data and especially the, the qualitative data that, that Mark was talking about. But um, 
you know, we, we'll, we'll need to unpack that. Thank you. And I know we have the link to your full research paper up on our website somewhere, probably in multiple places. Um, but Ashley, who's running this meeting, can you, um, can you put the link up in an answer to George Lanou's question so that other people can see it as well? Just to, as a reminder of that. Thank you. Yeah, each of the findings on that report have a, gra a table of things broken down and we, I think, ubiquitously included the, like, the, the three. So identif they identified as liberal, identified as moderate, identified conservative, at least on most of them, if not all of them. Thank you. So the next question, um, we've got another one from Bill, which I'll get to in a minute. I'm going to go to someone who hasn't answered one yet. Uh, this one's from Daniel Klinghard. I'd love to see some of the training for civil dialogue for students and faculty. Can you recommend something in this area or examples of best practices? Well, there's, so one of the organizations in, uh, in UNC that's new is the Program for Public Discourse. And so what it's, one of the goals that it has is to really provide these tools to faculty and students in debate and deliberation. Um, and so that's a program that got off the ground last year. Um, it's continuing to grow. Um, I'm part of that organization. Um, and so there's, and there's a number of different um, methods you can apply, right? And, and for different things, right? Debate is one and it is very formal and there's you know, specific rules on how you do it. Um, but there's other, other means as well uh, to engage in, in constructive dialogue and one of the things that we're, we're thinking of doing, um, this is just very much in the thought phase, is either finding if someone has already created a repository of all these tools um, or creating that repository ourselves um, to, to offer to professors and teachers and anyone that's interested in um, really trying to you know, create constructive dialogue in whatever session, whatever manner that they're hoping to do. You know, I think what, you know, there's all these different kind of pedagogical thoughts on this, right? I mean, you know, I teach, I teach writing and literature. And, you know, for me, this is like, this is sort of the fundamental, this is fundamental rhetoric, right? The wheelhouse of like, you have to understand the opposition. And, you know, so, and there, so there are some pedagogical um, models or research that suggest that structured debate doesn't actually help you because it's not, you know, it's so outside of what students are going to be encountering uh, in real life, right? It, it's not the, you know, I'm sitting in a conference with my professor discussing my paper and we disagree, right? What does that look like? We can't be like, I would like to now offer a formal rebuttal to your sentence, right? Um, and so there's no one there with the Roberts rules making it happen. Um, and so this idea of, can I just, can I see what the other side is thinking? Can I offer, um, you know, can I offer some kind of gray area on that? So the, just the nuances of rhetorical thought, I think are a really good place to start and what sort of we work from in the English department. So I think one of the nice things that the, you know, I think the PPD, or the Pro Program for Public Discourse is trying to think about doing is offering some sort of like pedagogical tools, right? And, um, you know, with the understanding, again, not to say you need to recreate your whole curriculum, but to understand that maybe this is harder than people realize and it is something you have to teach. Um, and you, you can't just model it, right? So that the student said, yes, my in instructor is encouraging ideas, right? But that maybe it's a step further than that, that we have to, we actually have to actively teach this. But I think, you know, Mark is absolutely right. That it's not really clear what kind of, you know, pedagogical um, research in terms of thinking about it this way. Like there's stuff of like how to teach rhetoric, how to teach classic argument, how to teach, um, you know, argument in writing, but, and, uh, and how to develop that, but not on like, how do I then apply that to what like civil discourse or constructive dialogue outside of the classroom looks like? How do I actively teach that? So I think that's a growing area of need. And I think there's, I mean, there's certainly different situations, right? If you're trying to get citizens together to discuss political issues, that's, you know, that might take one kind of set of tools, right? If you're doing something in the classroom, that's another set of tools. And if it's a high school classroom versus a college, that's, those are probably different tools, right? 
Yeah, we, we actually we got another question about that. If my college were going to do training on free speech, who would we contact to do it? So you're, I think that you're right. There's a huge need for that. So um, maybe that's a good next step for you or for the Martin Center. Well, um, when you think about free, and so there's, this is where kind of, kind of the terms kind of come into play too. If you're strictly talking about free speech, in my mind, that's def, might, that might be something different than constructive dialogue. Right, free speech is a, a you know the legal concept, right? And so, if someone, if if you were talk, talking in the college scenario, who who would I want to come in to talk about free speech? I'd say fire. But if you want to talk about constructive dialogue, that's probably going to be somebody else. Right? Yeah, and and I think the key thing is, I mean, yeah, absolutely, like parsing out what these different things mean. And it seems like what people are really hungry for is constructive dialogue, right? Because First Amendment stuff is not easy, right? Like, if we're easy, we wouldn't keep coming back to it in every iteration of the Supreme Court, right? Um, and it's messy and even across these political lines, right? But um, the idea of just like, I wanna be able to have a conversation with someone who thinks differently from me and actually have that go somewhere and maybe both of us leave that conversation transformed. Um, you know, that that's something that I think most people, I'm going to go with maybe 99%. There's a few who just want to shout at people. But, um, you know, I think that most people want that and agree that it's a function that higher education should serve, that it's something our students should leave being able to do. Um, and I think because of that, it needs to be a fundamentally collaborative effort. Um, because, you know, if you think of the, the way the places in which students meet these ideas, right, it's not just in a political science class. Um, it's in their English class. Um, where they're writing. It's in their biology class, right? Especially now. I mean, if we're if we think about how political COVID got like really fast, right? Um, and so I think, you know, I, I think that one of the big things of whatever this looks like at, at trainings is it needs to involve people from across the disciplines um, and it needs to be multivalent and it needs to be probably faculty driven since the core thing is pedagogical. I think the, the I guess last thing I'd say is, whenever if you to do constructive disagreement, you have to assume the person that you who disagrees with you is of good intent. And I think if you look politically now, it's almost impossible to <clears throat> for people to view you know conservatives to view liberals or liberals to view conservatives as having positive intent. I mean, because I think as we saw through our research, right there's there's assumptions about what those people are like um, that you're that you're talking to, and if you Think they're racist or sexist or they're not open-minded from the get-go you're probably not too you're probably not going to have a very good constructive dialogue <laughs> dialogue with them right so i think there's an important point to assume the person sitting across from the, ta the table from you has some good intent thank you so now i've got a question from gene douglas and it may be a little bit out of your wheelhouse but we'll go with it anyway what protections are there for faculty who do not have tenure if they are conservative or they say something unpopular or they or they want to do something that isn't supported by the university in terms of bringing a speaker. I, the only thing I would say, I guess what I've seen is people who have tenure, at least in this, in this, in this last iteration, there have been a number or this last, you know, recently with with the, um, the protests, et cetera, there have been faculty who have done simple things on Facebook that have gotten fired and I think they didn't have tenure, but then there have been faculty that have said some pretty outrageous things that have had tenure and have not been fired. Um, so I think I think the probably the biggest protection for them would be going to seek out support from the legal team at FIRE. Um, <clears throat> but I, I think, and it depends a lot on what you said and how you said it and where you said it um, as well. But certainly, I would say someone that has tenure probably has a, a big leg up uh, on that. Jennifer, you want to add anything? Yeah, I, yeah, I mean, as untenured faculty, uh, I understand. But it, I think it's also tricky because it that situation varies so much from institution to institution um, versus in, in terms of how precarious those positions are. Um, you know, I think a, even even within departments at UNC, I would say there, it varies a lot in how precarious those positions are and what you do. Um, so yeah, I think, like Mark said, working with another group like FIRE 
who can talk about like where you are maybe crossing, potentially crossing First Amendment lines um, and offering those protections because that, that is where it gets messy um, for sure. Yeah, and there's also a difference between private and public universities. So public universities have to support the First Amendment. Private universities, unless they've made some kind of statement where they support the First Amendment, um, don't have to. So it depends on who you're employed by. Let's see, the next question is from Paul. Did you have any concerns that the respondents were self-censoring their responses to you as they admitted to doing in the classroom? Mm -hmm. I don't, I mean, I didn't think, I tended not to think that. I mean, the, the easiest, I mean, the easiest way to self-censor is not do this, not do the survey, I guess. Um, <clears throat> but if you started to do the survey and you believe that it was, that it was, you know, they, they wouldn't be able to track you down or we wouldn't be able to track you down, uh, I wouldn't see any reason to self-censor. I don't know. What do you think, Jennifer? Yeah, I mean, I think we try to limit that just by, you know, being really clear at the beginning of the instrument, you know, per everything IRB wants that, you know, this is anonymous, their identities are protected, like you have to lay that all out and they have to read it and click and agree to it. Um, but yeah, I mean, in terms of if there had been more disparity, I think between the incentivized and the unincentivized model, um, I might be more suspicious of that. Um, or if we heard something in the focus groups that were just like totally different, but those students definitely were not holding back. <laughs> um, I was like, wow. Um, <laughs> it was hard to control my face at times. Um, and so, yeah, I, I, I don't see any evidence of that. Um, if I did have concerns, they were allied by the, the data. Yeah. Yeah, I think Jennifer makes a good point of if you compare the incentivized where we gave them, I forget what it was, like 20, 15 or 20 bucks or something to do it or gift card. I think it's 10. Bucks. <laughs> 10 bucks. Yeah, yeah I didn't okay. even that much. Amazon bucks, $10 yeah. gift card apparently gets you some, <laughs> some serious <Yeah>. love. <laughs> yeah. And so, and so if you saw a big difference between the incentivized ones who are taking, you, you might think we're more, um, <clears throat> we're doing it more for the money versus those that did it for, for free. You, you would think that'd be a concern, but I, I, as Jennifer said, I don't, there was not much disparity at all. So I, I don't, I, I wouldn't infer that there was an issue. Now I have a question that came in via Facebook. What role should the university play in preventing <clears throat> disruption of expression of alternate viewpoints? Well, I think, I mean, and Jennifer and I might disagree, <laughs> disagree on this, but I'm pretty much a First Amendment person and I, I don't like the heckler's veto. So I would say, you, I mean, if you want to let someone stand up and do something at the beginning or say something, sure, that's fine. Um, but the speaker should be allowed to speak. And if they are not allowed to speak, then the people who are causing the disruption should be removed, which I think is pretty much the law. Um, <clears throat> so in my mind, it's fairly straightforward. And I think people should be allowed to be heard, even if they say totally crazy things. I, I went to the UK many, many years back, and there's this place called, I think, High's Corner, Speaker's Corner in Hyde Park. And you could hear all kinds of crazy people talking about all kinds of crazy stuff, but it was it was fun. I mean, it was interesting to hear them, you know, and I didn't agree with a lot of the stuff they said. And you could engage them and challenge them, but, you know, I think people should, and you especially should hear some of the people that are a little bit off because, you know, you know those might be the people you kind of want to <laughs> kind of want to watch, right? Keep an eye on, so. I don't know, Jennifer, what do you think? No, I mean, I am also a big First Amendment person. Um, I do just, I just think that, uh, you know, again, the, the First Amendment is, is not simple. Um, and I also think that where there's some really interesting emerging research about, um, you know, sort of the psychological impact of speech and, you know, speech as act and speech as harm. Um, and I think, so while I believe the university, especially a public university, has a responsibility to um, protect the First Amendment um, and to, to protect speakers, I think it also has a responsibility to protect its students um, in the learning context and to, be, um, to protect them from harm. Um, and so, and that, 
I don't think that means shutting down the speaker, but I do think that it means, um, you know, being proactive in terms of what kind of resources certain students might need in reaction to that speaker being on campus. Um, you know, I think especially now, um, you know, in as, as we see emerging movements um, and, you know, it's sort of a changing understanding of like racial dynamics, for example, and, and what that looks like. So I think the university needs to actively consult, you know, they need to engage in constructive dialogue <laughs> with everybody who is potentially involved in this issue. So you're bringing Jordan Kessler to campus, like maybe talk to the black faculty leaders, um, talk to all the groups who might be involved in this and have different ideas and say, what is this going to look like? You know, what are your concerns? What are your concerns? Um, you know, and then I also think about like keeping the campus safe, right? If there, if that's going to bring a mob of armed white supremacists to campus, then that's something they need to consider. Um, so I think it's just, it's really complicated. So yes, fundamentally, I say, you know, let them march. But I also understand that it's bigger than that for a lot of people. And I think it's the university's responsibility to, to think of all those dynamics. I think the other thing I would say is that those of us at the university who want to bring speakers um, would be, and this includes students as well, <clears throat> would be advised to bring in people who have, and this is where in the program for public discourse, we, we're we want to bring in people who have evidence-based research, right? We don't want to, we don't want to bring in someone that's going to, you know, a charlatan or someone that's going to, to, you know, just get people riled up and has no, doesn't have a lot of data for what they're saying. Um, you want to bring in people that are going to have an intelligent conversation and that, <clears throat> that they can debate someone from the other side and it's, people will come away with, the, you know, some, again, have grown through the, grown through the conversation. So I think those of us yeah, at the yeah. university who bring in people really need to think about who it is that we're bringing in and what, you know, is this person, is this gonna elevate the conversation or is this gonna degrade the conversation? And, and while some of the yeah. people, the provocateurs might be like, wow, that's really, that's gonna show them. I think in the end, you know, if you bring in, if you're conservative and you bring in a provocateur, you're not, you're not helping yourself, you're not helping the university. Um, <clears throat> so instead let's bring in someone that's, that's gonna talk about conservative ideas at an intellectual level right? um, and has research to, to support that. Yeah, and I, can say, I think that's another responsibility is to say like we need to have actually intelligent conversation that is evidence-based and research-based rather than just cause incendiary issues. I'm sorry, Jenna. No, it's, I just, we've got two more questions that I'm hoping we can get to before we, before we uh, end the, the broadcast. And so if you could give very quick answers to these, that would be, that would be really great. So is there a sense in which progressive students are more adversely affected because their views are rarely challenged? I've heard that, I mean, I've heard that view in a lot of ways. And I think that I would tend to subscribe to it a little bit if you assume that everyone, because a lot of times if conservative students are self-censoring, you're not going to hear them rebut those, your ideas, right? So you don't have a chance to hear views you might not have heard of and have to think them through and respond. Yeah, people need to know that those views are out there because it changes the way you think, right? If you're like, wow, I didn't know people thought that way, then it changes the way you approach it. Thank you. And what we're going to get to this one last one. Does UNC have programs that consistently promote debates open to all about controversial public policy? Yeah, well, that's that's really what the program for public discourse is all about. That's That started last year. Um, it's run now. We have a new faculty lead, uh, Sarah Truel. Um, from the political science department, and I'm, I'm on that, and, it, and it's made up of both liberals and conservatives on the advisory board, and um, we want to continue to grow that program. Well, thank you, Mark and Jennifer, for your presentation and for conducting this research in the first place. Thank you to everyone who is listening in via Zoom and Facebook. Um, if anyone has additional follow-ups, you can get in touch with me at ja robinson at jamesgmartin.center. You can also find us, of course, on Facebook and on Twitter and on our website. And I will, you know, I'll follow up with Mark and Jennifer and get answers if you if you want to follow up or if you want to try to replicate their research in your state.
So thank you all and everyone have a fantastic afternoon. Thank you. Thanks.